Well, good morning, Wine Press. How are you today? My name is Jack, and I have the absolute privilege of welcoming you to today's message, wherever and whenever you are watching this. Today we have Pastor Arthur, father of the house, uh, bringing a first message in a series on Kingdom Covenant. Uh, it's a great one. It's got lots of scripture, so you can need a pen, a paper, a, a good hot coffee. Um, but there is so much to unpack in this and so much knowledge that Pastor Arthur is trying to impart to us. So why don't you sit back, enjoy, and I will catch you after the worship. Bye, guys. Hi, Wine Press. How you doing? It's good to be with you again today. Danny and I just had a couple of days off and went cycling. We did about 350Ks. And it's fantastic and feel fit now and bums a bit sore, <laughs> but you know, it's, we had a great time. So, but it's great to be back with you and I'm excited to be back with you today because I'm, I'm starting a new series called, uh, and I'm, uh, I just I love this, this kind of stuff because it gives us the basis for our faith. And I really want to encourage you today. I'm actually doing a bunch of teaching. So you might need a pen and paper and you might have to play this a few times to kind of get the whole, the whole kind of package of the thing. But, but hang in there with me as I, as I take you through this, these, these foundational truths for us as Christians. And it kind of stems out of, you know, my quiet time this morning, my journaling time, I was journaling out of Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2. And it talks about, you know, the, the, the Lord is my refuge and my strength. And I just love that. And it goes on to talk about that, that even if the, the earth is shaken and the, the mountains are thrown in, into, the, into the sea, I'm, I will not fear because the Lord is my refuge and my strength, my ever-present help in times of trouble. And you know, I was just journaling that this morning. I was just thinking to myself, how true that is for today. You know, like we've had two years of COVID, this, this worldwide pandemic, and then we've kind of jumped out of that. We feel like we're just getting out of that. And you blink and suddenly Russia's invading Ukraine and, and the news is full of that. It's full of COVID, then it's full of the Ukraine thing. And then you blink and then suddenly there's floods in Queensland and New South Wales and the news is full of that. And it's like we get caught up you know, in this 21st century, we get caught up with all these, these details. We're so focused on the details that sometimes we can get lost and we forget about the big picture. In Christian, there is a big picture happening. There is a big picture happening. Never lose sight of that. So God is our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. And it's like, it's like for, for, uh, for us, there's a big picture in Scripture. And if you like, it's the DNA of Scripture. Remember, the DNA is, is, is these two coils of acidic acid that kind of, there's two chains, if you like, that kind of intertwine and go through every cell of our body. Well, that's the same of, of, of what I'm about to share with you um, in Scripture, in the Bible, from Genesis and um, through the Revelation. There's these two chains of DNA um, that's going through it. And these two strains is covenant and um, covenant and kingdom. I just about forgot that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? So covenant and kingdom. Covenant is about relationship, the two becoming one. And, and kingdom is about responsibility. And what is it that God would have us do on his behalf? So these two strains, if you like, are like responsibility, relationship and responsibility. Relationship and responsibility. Relationships about being. Responsibility is about doing. And this story, this DNA, runs all the way through the Bible. And today we're going to start this new series by just talking about one of these strands, which is called covenant. And to, to, to do that, we're going to go back to the story of Abram in Genesis 11 through 20, um, Genesis 27. So chapter 11 through 27 uh, is the story of, of, of Abram. And Abram, um, we find there, has this, this call of God in Genesis chapter 12 there. And he receives this promise of God, you know, like I'm going to bless you and make your children the nations and they're going to bless all the other cultures and so on. And then for the next couple of chapters, it's like we get a description of what's happening in, in Abram's life there. And it really kind of heats up around chapter 15 where, where God appears to him and says, I am your shield and your very great reward. And then we, we find something interesting. Abram goes into this kind of conversation with God. And, and it says, oh, oh, sovereign God, I've been waiting all this time, all these years for you to fulfill your promise. Well, that's the promise back in Genesis chapter 12. 
And now he's saying, but, but what can you give me? Because Eliezer of Damascus is going to inherit my estate because I, I don't have any, any children. And what's happening here, folks, is, is Abram is testing the waters, if you like. He's, he's testing the waters in terms of this Mid Middle Eastern bartering kind of system that they had going on there, that general form of life that they had going there. And Abram's seeing if God is, is willing to go into this, this bartering system. Because Abram's previously heard from the Lord, you know, uh, you know you're going to have all these children, these ch children are going to become so numerous, they're going to bless, um, bless every other culture and influence every other culture. But Abram's like 100 years old now, and he's probably thinking he's past it, you know, he's, he's kind of testosterone levels dropped off, and, and he's thinking, you know, it's, not, it's just not going to, it's just not going to happen. So Abraham here is, is trying to push the point with God and is seeing whether the Lord is open to negotiation. And, and, the negotiation, and the negotiation in that time and that culture is only going to be settled and sealed if they have a covenant between them. Because a covenant would mean that whatever has been said, Genesis 12, is now secure. Whatever has been spoken about has now got a sense of, of permanency about it. And that, that happens because in covenant, the two people who covenant together become one. They give up their independent identities and their new identities are tied up with one another and for forever. And how this is symbolized in those times, and generally, I guess, is that this is symbolized in two ways. The covenant is symbolized in two ways. The first way is in blood through the death of a substitute, the killing of a substitute. And secondly, it's in, t in the taking up of a new life, which is bound up in the relationship that, that a person has with a new covenant partner. Now think about this. If, if you share... Um, and identity with somebody, somebody else, that means that everything that they have is yours. Everything about them, all the resources, everything about them is now yours. And no longer um, just talked about as something that may be possible, but that now you have access to them because they are yours. Do you get that, Christian? Are you getting this underlying truth? This is full of kind of oh, just deep truth, you know. But anyway, it's similar... We're, we're trying to get the picture of this, if you like, in the last vestige of, of covenant making that we have, which I guess is the marriage ceremony, isn't it? You know, where we talk about how couples, um, the, the couples bring their independent identities and they kind of lay them down. And then they, they find a common identity that they share. And, you know, so they have shared, shared name, shared family name, shared families, shared homes, shared bank accounts and so forth. So Abram is looking for this. Abram is looking for this. God has spoken. The promise has been given in Genesis 12, but it hasn't been ratified yet in covenant. Until this point, it's just words. It hasn't been ratified in sacrifice and blood. In other words, what Abram is looking for in this context, in this text, in this chapter here, Abram is looking for certainty because certainty cannot come in words alone. Listen to this. He needs the Word to become flesh. He needs the Word to become flesh. So they have this chat. They have this little chat. And then God says the Word that Abram's been longing to hear. And God says, well, bring me a heifer and list a whole bunch of, to, of, of, of other animals. So Abraham, as soon as he hears this, is, is off. This is it. So he's off. He's grabbing the heifer and all the other animals that, uh, and he, he slaughters them. Then he cuts them from nose to tail. He cuts them from nose to right down the middle. So not across, but down the middle. And he cuts them across, and then he puts them out. So he puts one half of the heifer there, the other half of the heifer there. Now he's covered in blood and gore as he's doing this, and, and then all the other animals. And he's making this corridor, and he's walking up and down this corridor, just putting this stuff out, and he's, he's covered in, 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 all this, in all this stuff here. So in doing this, he's, he's walking between the pieces himself. He's covered in all this blood and stuff here. And what, is, what Abram is doing when, as he's given up these animals is that he's making a commitment. He's making a commitment to give up his own life, seeing in the substitute of the animals. 
and substitute of the, 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 the sacrifices that, it, that is given there. So the, the promises are written in the blood of the substitutes that now lay dead in the field. And then he waits. And then we're told there that as darkness falls, he gets overwhelmed and, uh, with fatigue and he falls into this deep sleep. Then the scripture tells us in that moment, the Lord appears. And we see in scripture that the Lord appears in the representation of a smoking fire pot and a blazing um, torch. Now, fire has always been a symbol of God's presence. So here we find this blazing torch and this smoking fire pot is apparently suspended in space. So, and, and it's suspended below the canopy of, the, of, the, of, the, of heaven, if you like, of, of, of stars. The very things that God has indicated represent the descendants of Abraham. And then the fire upon the torch pass between, goes through this corridor again, and says in that action, God is saying in that action, that forever I will be one with Abram. I will be one with Abraham. Now understand this, friends, that in that day, in Abraham's day, that was a covenant-making society. So anybody who hears this story understands totally what is going on. They understood that there's two late leaders. There's a greater leader and there is a lesser leader. And both represent the identities of their people. And the greater leader confers by grace upon the lesser leader the capacity to come into that relationship. And this is what's happening right here. The stronger God is conferring upon the lesser, Abram, the right to relationship. So covenant has always been crafted in grace. It always required the initiative of the greater one. It always required the initiative of the strong one. And God is that greater and strong one. And God confers grace upon the weaker one, Abraham, the right to relationship. And it's not the relationship that a slave would have with his master. It's not the relationship of an employee with, with his boss. It's a relationship of oneness. The two shall become one. It's family language, isn't it? They become one. So God confers upon Abraham this astonishing gift, which is that he is now one with God. And though God, who is the stronger and the greater one, um, Abram, because he's one with God, can now speak to God as if he is one. And that's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Now let's pause there and let's pick up another thing. The symbols um, of death and birth. The symbols of the covenant. The symbol of death is represented in this context through the death of the animals. And what that means is that is Abraham's laying, cutting these animals up and laying them down there and, and sacrificing the animals. He's saying, I'm giving up my identity. I've walked through the corridor of blood and I've gone to the other side where my covenant brother is waiting for me. And his identity and his people and all that he is now become mine and I become tied up with them for all eternity. And then God passes between the pieces and chooses to give up his freedom. Can you imagine this? You know, that God chooses to embrace this degree of restriction, if you like, for he's now restricted by the identity that he shares with Abram. Now, God, this, I mean, if you're just thinking about this long term and how prophetically this kind of, kind of works out. Now, God doesn't have to do this, but he does it, and it's... And if you like, it's all upside for Abram, isn't it? Abram and his, and his children, they've got a great deal. They, they give up their old identity and they take on the new identity. And the corridor of blood, if you like, perhaps symbolizing a birth canal of a new life at the other end. You go through the, you start at one end, but you go through the birth canal and you come out to, to new life. Now we can understand it for Abram. And I wonder whether Abram ever at night is sitting by a campfire. I wonder if he ever thought about that event and wondered how that could how, apply to God of, of, of heaven. How could the God of the universe give up his life for me? How could that be, Abram might have been wondering. How could he be so committed to me that he says he's prepared to die for me? How could the God of the universe somehow be born into my identity and become become one with me. So it's not just about Abram becoming one with God. God becomes one with, with him. How could the one who flung the galaxies into the far-off velvet 
curtains of space come through the birth canal? How could that be? And it's, an, it's a great question. But in covenant, that is what is being said. That is what being said. And don't you just find yourself amazed by, amazed by that? Don't you just find your heart swelling with the, the goodness of God? Doesn't your heart grow with the, the grace of God that at the very beginning, way back in Abram's time, way back in the beginning, God committed himself to die for us. Way back then, he committed himself to die for us. That at the very beginning, he committed to going through the birth canal, weak and vulnerable, in place, in our place, as one of us. Friends, don't you find that amazing? I find that incredible. Yay, God, that at the very beginning of the story of covenant, God commits himself to something that will inevitably cost him a great and tragic and suffering loss. And it will be a covenant that is, that, is, that is sealed by the shedding of the blood of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. Whoa, is this ringing any bells in anybody's head today? And, does, and, and God does it for the people who will be called the children of Abraham, the children of faith. This is absolutely amazing, isn't it, church? Yay, God. So in this text and through the action that, that, that God is taking, God is now saying that he's now one with us, that he's now one with us. And let's be clear what that means. You know, everything that God has is now ours. Everything that God has access to, we have access to. Uh, uh, you know, so we can come boldly into the throne room of God. We, it's, it's just incredible, this stuff. And, and we have complete freedom to talk to God about whatever he's doing. And just to illustrate that, we actually see it in Abram's life. So Abraham in Genesis 17 is confronted with this great theophany and he's talking to these, these um, couple of angels appearing at his tent. And he's talking to them and he hears about how a baby is going to be born. A baby is going to be born to Abraham. Firstly, I guess that's what he's talking about. But prophetically, you, you can see where that goes. And then he kind of walks with the Lord and, and, and as the two angels are disappearing and off in the distance to see Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Abram knows what's going to happen and, and God's going to destroy them. And he says, you know, if you're going to destroy them, what if there's some good people there? And it goes into this conversation. Remember that? So it's incredible that he's able to say this to the, to the God of the universe. But he's able to say this because he's now a covenant partner with God just as we are. You see, the reason he's able to do that, the reason we're able to do that, is because we bear his name. We bear his name, which means that you have his identity, that you have his identity, that you're one with him. So in chapter 17, when the Lord comes again to Abraham and basically says this in summary, walk before me blameless, live before me, live in my shadow, live in connection with me as I intended and for, for Adam and Eve, live with my impression on you, with my hand filling your life. Never move from the outstretched presence of my hand on your life. And he says that to you and I today. Are you doing that? Are you, are you staying close to the shepherd? Stay close to the shepherd. The whole secret of the Christian life, stay close to the shepherds. In other words, God is saying here, allow your identity to be reflected in your behavior. Allow your identity first reflected in your behavior second it's not the other way around and now we can understand this because of covenant folks the truth is you can't put behavior before identity you can't prove to god that you're his child by doing good works by doing good things you actually do good things because you're his child. It's a response thing. It's God working in you. So changing you, changing your desires and stuff that you want to do God's stuff. That's how you prove it. It's an inside out thing, not the other way around. You do good things because they reflect the identity of the one who is your father. And as we do, we begin to show God to people. We, we show the Father's eyes as people look in our eyes. We'll see a light in our eyes. We begin to reveal our Father's face. We begin to do things as if it were the very hands of God Himself doing them. In other words, we walk the way He walks. We talk the way He talks. We think the way He thinks. 
So the Lord comes to Abraham and he says here in verse 17, as I said before, walk before me blameless. I've come to make good on my covenant. I've come to take the covenant we've made and take it deeper. And as we renew it, you're going to find new and fresh steps to it. And the Lord says, first of all, and to prove this to you, Abram, first of all, I'm going to take one of the letters out of my name. I'm going to put it into your name. So uh, God's, God's name uh, is... <laughs> In the Hebrew, there's four consonants for God's name. It's Y-H-W-H. And God's taken one of those consonants and he's put in it Abraham, Abram's name. So what that means is that Abram now becomes Abraham. Abram now becomes Abraham. It means that Abram's name, which means exalted father, now goes to Abraham, which means father of nations. So his name meaning goes from Abram to Abraham, exalted father, to now father of many nations against that prophetic thing again and the lord says and just so you remember that this is a permanent deal the next thing he says in this chapter is i'm going to give you a scar and and abraham's throw the thing oh well that, that that's okay until he hears what it is and it's circumcision and i can just imagine abraham's face kind of dropping his jaw kind of dropping and uh, his hands going to a protective um, position and uh, so i just sort of see abraham and uh, sort of saying, God, could I give you a fingernail or could I cut my hair or, or something like that? You know, and, and God says, no, it's going to be circumcision. So, um, so Abra Abraham's kind of uh, thinking about this and, and he's probably sitting by the campfire and thinking, well, you know, I know my name's changed from Abram to Abraham, but I wonder how God's name's changed. And of course, we do know that God's name does change, doesn't it? Because it goes from several, uh, it goes to Savior, Savior Lord as well as Sovereign uh, Lord. So it's not just Sovereign Lord, it's Saviour Lord as well. But just to finish here, friends, I've got to encourage you that covenant goes both ways. Abraham receives all the blessings and resources that God has, God's co the, his covenant partner has, but it also means that God receives all the resources that his covenant partner has. So God receives all the resources that, that Abraham has. And this plays out, you know, a few chapters later in Genesis 22, where, where God calls him to give up the one identifier object and resource of, of Abraham's life. And it's like it, Abraham never blinks when God says, you know, I want you to sacrifice your son. Now just think about this. What is this? What is the sign, the symbol, the picture of Abraham's life? Now he's an old man. Well, it's his son. You know, his, his, he's a hundred. He's almost dead in, in his body. But the boy is alive. And the boy will be the symbol um, and the sign of all that God will do in the future. It's the, it's the promise. In a very real sense, this boy represents Abraham's life. And God says, you already have everything of mine. And now I want everything of yours. And all that is yours is tied up in the boy. And, and I guess nowadays, this is what Jesus says to you and I, doesn't it? Jesus says, I've given you my life. Now I want you to give me your life. I want you to lay it all down. I want you to take up your cross and give up your old life. And then through doing that, you'll find new life, your life um, in me, your covenant partner. And when you do that, you can ask whatever you like. In my name, it will be given to you. John 15, as we live in covenant partnership. As we die to ourselves, then we live. That's this whole covenant thing. It's a two-way deal. We're one in this. Jesus says, I will give you my life, and you have to give me your life. That's what covenant relationship's about. That's what covenant relationship is about. And if you give it to me, Jesus says, you'll, you'll more fully understand what it means to live in covenant, to live in the resurrection life, even if it means embracing death. Through death, you will, lie, you will live. So as you walk away today, friends, as you leave this message today, I want you to think to yourself, I am one with God. I am a covenant child. I have a new name. I have a new identity. I am. I am one with God. I am one with God, the king of the universe. So now you are a prince or you are a princess of the king. You are one with him. What His resources are now your resources. And, and, and your life is now his life. And then, uh, oh, yea, God, so lift up your head. In this time of craziness in our world, you can say, the Lord is my refuge and strength. He is my ever-present help 
in time of trouble. Why? Because I'm a covenant child. It doesn't matter on the details of what's happening around me today. It is a long term, the bigger, the bigger picture. I am in covenant with God and He has me. This world is not my home. I am just passing through to a better place. This is a, a time of preparation and test and, 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 and all the other stuff that God does in our life. But, but now I can have assurance that even though the air shakes and the mountains are thrown into the sea, God is my refuge and strength, my ever-present help in time of trouble, and I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. So live out your destiny, church. Live out your destiny as a covenant child in Jesus' name. Glory to God. I'm so looking forward to this series. God bless you, church. See you next week. space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need a reminder? Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears a burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire
become what may in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning. I know. Well, how good was that, guys? That message, there was so much in there, and I can't wait to hear what he's gonna bring next week. But that's all we have time for today. So like always, make sure you like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so you don't miss anything. Hit us up on the socials. Make sure you head to our website, which is in the description below, and check out everything you need to know about WinePress, any courses we're running, any updates. Uh, the new building is launching soon, so stay tuned for updates on that. And you can also give your tithes and offerings and check out any of the missions we support both nationally and internationally. But until next time, guys, have an amazing week. I pray that God blesses you and goes before you in whatever you are doing. Until then, guys, bye.